great, isn't it? That is really good. Brother Otis, I never heard that song before. That's, thank you for sharing that with us. That's, uh, I almost wish I was preaching on a different topic today. That, that would, that's so appropriate. I'll be touching on it, but uh, that, that's, that's a whole subject all of itself. Because I, I do believe the Lord is at the doors. And I know we've been talking about that for a long, long time. I got saved in 72 when I first started coming to church here. In 73, I started hearing that kind of uh, preaching, and uh, some critics of Christians and Christianity say that, well, you know, you've been talking about the Lord coming back for a long, long time. He's not back here yet. Well, he's, he's, uh, he's 45 years closer to coming than when I first started hearing about it. Amen? See, he's going to come back. We just don't know when. He, even he said he didn't know when. It was up to the Father. But we know that the time is near because the events that we're uh, seeing around us are predicted in Scripture. And you and I have always uh, wanted, and I think most of you anyway, you wanted to be the rapture generation, right? You wanted to be the ones that were raptured. Well, this, this, is what, this is the job you bid for. I mean, this is the kind of world we're supposed to have before the rapture, right? So we shouldn't be surprised by what we're seeing if this is the rapture generation, right? Still gets us down, though, doesn't it? But, uh, we, but we'll talk about that a little bit more, and, and I'm going to be talking more about that in the coming weeks. But, but yeah, uh, this is exactly what we should expect if we are in the last generation. So thank you, Brother uh, Otis, for, for singing about that. All right, today we want to go to Matthew chapter 5. And if you do not have a handout, raise your hands. The ushers will get to you with one. They will rush to your side. And in Matthew chapter 5, if you are there... <coughs> We're going to read one verse. <clears throat> Everyone got one? Okay, verse 5 in this beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much for being our God, our Savior, our Lord, our friend, our provider, our protector, for being all the things you are to us. Thank you, thank you for not only the things you give us, but what you are to us that we can run to you anytime we're in need and anytime when we're not in need, just to bask in your presence and in your glory. Thank you, Father, for always being there for us. I ask for that you forgive us for taking you for, for granted so much and not running to you whenever we have the opportunity. Father, I pray that you would have your will in the service this morning as we look into your word and think about this passage and what it means. I pray that you'd help us to apply it to ourselves by, with the help of the Holy Spirit. May we be open to his teaching and his instruction, his guidance, and even his conviction. And I ask for that when the opportunity presents itself at the end of the service, that you would help us to respond to what the Holy Spirit prods us to do. That we may leave here a more meek people than when we arrived pray that you'd help us to live that out each and every day. May your will be done in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name, and for his sake, and with thanksgiving. Amen. All right. Meekness. What does that mean? Well, the dictionary definition of meekness, what this word actually means, is talking about a mildness, it's talking about a calmness, uh, talking about a composition of, of disposition, uh, a soothing disposition, a, a, a firmness, a, a calmness, but firmness, especially under conditions in, adapted to excite great emotion. I'm reading the actual definition here. Especially under conditions adapted to excite great emotion. Exactly what Brother Otis just sang about. A state of resistance to elation, depression, anger, etc. In other words, a non-emotionally based response to things, just a steady calmness, an evenness of mind, that calm temper or firmness of mind which is not easily elated or depressed. That's a secondary definition. 
That's what meekness is all about. It's related to what we talked about in the very first week of the, of the series that we're calling the B attitudes, the B attitudes, what we are to be. Now, we see a lot of things in Scripture. I'm just backing up a little bit here and, and reiterating for those of you who haven't been with us for the whole series. The Bible has a lot of things to say about thou shalt not do this, thou shalt do that. This series is not about doing things or about not doing things. This series is, is about who we are, what we are to be, not what we are to do. So that's what we're, why we're talking today about be meek, and that's the title of, on your handout. Be meek. And as I said, it's related to being humble, but not quite. This is a little bit different. The first week we talked about humility. We talked about uh, killing our pride, and that's the first B attitude. That's the foundation of all the rest. But this meekness is, is all, although it's related, it's a little bit different. So let's just dive in. You've only got two blanks here today, only two, two uh, points, because this is a very short verse, and they break down just like the verse says. Blessed are the meek. That's your first one. Blessed are the meek. You already had it filled in before I told you because you knew what it was. Blessed are the meek. What does it mean to be meek? Well, as I said, it's that strong uh, temper, temper of spirit in which we accept his dealings with us as good. We accept all his dealings with us as good. We talked about Job, uh, I believe, last week. Job accepted God's dealings with him as good, at least at first. Then he started to get a little bit off track and started defending himself against charges that he was unjust and a sinner, and then he started blaming God in a roundabout way. And then at the end, God showed up and straightened him out, <laughs> and he went back to being meek again and accepting God's will, which is exactly what meekness is. It's, it's, it's accepting what God is doing in our lives without disputing or resisting. It's closely linked with the word humility. Let me, let me use an example here. That might help us in figuring out what meekness actually is. In Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we read this passage. And Miriam and Aaron, that's Moses' sister and brother. Miriam was his sister, Aaron was his brother. Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. This is his second wife. And he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? You know, it's really tough when you get criticized. Do you have difficulty dealing with criticism? It's hard to do that, isn't it? Now, I've been to conferences and seminars and things like that over the years and heard sermons, too, um, and talked to people. How do you deal with criticism? That's an important thing to learn. Very, very important. How do you deal with criticism? Um, well, first, you have to ask yourself, is it true? Is it valid? Does this person who's criticizing me have a valid point? Sometimes that's hard to think about or realize, especially if you can't stand the person who's criticizing you, or if the person who's criticizing you can't stand you. There's al already an animosity there. There's a wall that you start to build, right? But you have to kind of look through that and sometimes you have to get off by yourself, away from the person who's criticizing you, where, where you can think, uh, where, you, where you don't have to, where you're not tempted to react, let me say it that way. Where you can just think and, and, and say, well, Lord, is, is this true? I, am, I, am I really this way? A, am, I, am I really doing that kind of thing? Am I really coming across this way? And, and you have to decide, well, is it true? And if it is, well, you have to respond to that in spite of who the person who's criticizing you is and what their intentions are, uh, but you, you need to be who you are as God wants you to be, and you have to respond as God wants you to respond. Because ultimately, it's not between you and the other person, it's between you and God. For we battle not against flesh and blood. Remember? It's never the other person. It's always something else. It, it could be a legitimate criticism that the Lord is allowing to come against you to help you become a better person, or it could be an attack from the enemy, a spiritual attack from the enemy, and you have to discern which it is, right? So, so this, this guy, Moses, he, he's, he's chosen by God to fulfill this mission from God, and he's being criticized, and that's hard to deal with. You know what makes it even harder? When it comes from your family. You ever been there? This is a sister and brother, now, 
this happens all the time when you're kids, right? Siblings criticize each other all the time. It's just natural. But these are adults. These are grown people who are criticizing him, their own brother, not just for what he's done, but for the fact that he's, he's the spiritual leader. And they're saying, hey, we can do this just as well as you can. And you know what? That's absolutely true. Anybody could be standing right here, for example. Anybody could have done what Moses was doing. The problem was God didn't pick them. God picked him to do that. And Moses, his response was, well, well it doesn't actually go into his response, but it does say, it gives you a hint to it, because I cut off the verse and I didn't go on to the rest of the response. You'll read that for yourself. But let's go on to read this. Verse, 20, verse 2, then they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. <laughs> I love that. The Lord heard it. it it's, it's, I know, we know that Moses heard it, right? He heard it on several levels. He's being criticized, but criticized by his own family. That's hard to do, and I, I said that already. But here, the Lord heard it. That's the important thing. The Lord hears everything that's going on. He hears what's said to each of us. He watches what we do. He watches what's done to us. He knows all of it. Now the man, Moses, verse 3, was very meek. And this is the point we're trying to get to, the example. The man, Moses, was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Now, reading that on the face of it, With, with the, I'm, I'm going to say, the impression that many of us, I think, have about meekness, um, we would have a tendency to think this guy was a wimp. We almost have a tendency in our culture to connect meekness with weakness, or meekness with wimpiness. Uh, but that's not what the word means. Moses was very meek to the point where he didn't defend himself, and it wasn't because he was a wimp. Moses was a strong man. He was a shepherd in the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. You can't do that without developing some physical strength. He also, also had some boldness about him. Now, he didn't want to be a leader, but he was a, he was a bold man, an angry man. He had a temper. In fact, his temper cost him a great deal. Remember that? When he got angry with the people of Israel who were constantly complaining and bickering and criticizing and just mouthing off, I mean, it just, it, it happens, you know. Uh, and he finally just got so fed up with them that he disobeyed a direct command of God and smote the rock the second time when he was told to speak to the rock the second time. And because of that, God says, okay, now you've done it. <clears throat> I cannot let you go into the promised land. Because of this, you will die on this side of the Jordan. You will not cross the Jordan and go into the land I promised to you and your people. God didn't say this, but, I, but this is written between the lines. He said, I've got to set an example for the rest of the people. I've got to put the fear of myself in them. I've got to put the fear of God into them and show them that sin has consequences. I will forgive, but they are still consequences for disobedience to God. And so Moses uh, was going to die on the other side of the Jordan River. But you know, Moses did not get angry with God when God told him that. He did not rant and rave and get mad at God and shake his fist in God's face and say, you are so unfair. You put me through all this for all these years only to let me die in the wilderness? How unfair is that? He never said any of that. He never even thought it. He had a quiet acceptance of the will of God. That is meekness. That is meekness. King David displayed that same meekness when he was opposed by his enemies. Remember, as a young man, he was attacked numerous times by King Saul, his best friend's dad, who happened to be king of the country. King Saul had, had chosen David to come and be in the palace on a regular basis and, and, and play that uh, it's like a, a small harp called a lyre. Uh, it was a handheld instrument, and you strum it like this, <coughs> kind of like an auto harp, if you know what that is. And, and David would play, play that, and it would calm the king down. But sometimes the king would get so upset 
that he would throw spears at David and stick them in the wall at dinner time, trying to kill David. As I said before, King Saul, was, he was just a jerk. He was just a nasty guy. Uh, to be honest with you, I think King Saul was, just went insane over a period of time. David did not get, get angry at Saul. David had numerous instances where he had the opportunity to kill King Saul, but he did not. Because he had determined not to lay a finger on or touch the Lord's anointed because he knew that King Saul had been anointed by God through the prophet Samuel to be the king of Israel. And so he did not respond or react or uh, take, take vengeance on King Saul. You know why? One of the reasons was because King David himself had been anointed king of Israel. Saul didn't know it. But David knew it. He had been anointed to be the next king of Israel. He didn't know when that would take place. He knew that it would happen when King Saul died, but he wasn't going to be the one to make that happen. He knew that the authority had been delegated to him by God. He just didn't know when that would begin. But taking confidence and knowledge and strength, inner strength from the knowledge that he was going to be king, he could tolerate what King Saul did to him or tried to do to him because he knew that eventually he would be in charge. Later in David's life, David was opposed by his own son Absalom. Remember that? Absalom rose up in rebellion against his own father, raised an army to, to have a coup, a, a palace coup, and, and send his, his dad out of the country and possibly kill his father, his own father to take the throne. Did David respond to his own son by attacking him, by raising an army and going against his own son? No, he did not. What did he do? He fled. He took all his people, his entire administration. He left the palace. He left town. He just went into exile. Why did he do that? Because of his own experience as a young man. He didn't know whether Absalom had been anointed to be the next king without his knowledge. And so he wasn't going to lay his hand on what he thought might be the Lord's anointed in his own son. In other words, he put his trust in God. What God wants to do is what's going to happen. I'm not going to take any chance on opposing God's will. Whether it's King Saul who tried to kill me, or whether it's Absalom who might be trying to kill me, I know that God gave me the authority and King Saul was, didn't know that. It's possible that Absalom has the authority, and I don't know that. So David had confidence in God, not his own self, not his office or his, his power or, or prestige or position. He trusted God to direct his path, whatever that path might be. You know, the common assumption with us is that when a person is meek, it's because he can't help himself. I'm just going to take it because I can't do anything in return. And as I said before, most people think that to be meek is to be weak. But A.W. Tozer once wrote, and I'm going to uh, read his quote directly. <coughs> he said this. A.W. Tozer once wrote, The meek man is not a human mouse afflicted with a sense of his own inferiority. Rather, he may be in his moral life as bold as a lion and as strong as Samson, but he has stopped being fooled about himself. He has accepted God's estimate of his own life. He knows he is as weak and helpless as God declared him to be, but paradoxically, he knows at the same time that he is in the sight of God of more importance than angels. In himself, nothing. In God, everything. That's another view of, weakness, of, of meekness. It's not weakness. Now, think about this. The Lord Jesus Christ was meek as well, wasn't he? Now, sometimes we see pictures of, well, I call them pictures. I put them in quotation marks because no one knows what he looks like, right? No one knows what Jesus looks like. And that's intentional. Uh, but... I have to admit, when I grew up, I had this image of Jesus as kind of a, a weak, I'm talking about a physically weak uh, guy who, who wouldn't stand up for himself, wouldn't speak up for himself. Uh, he would teach things, but, but uh, uh, it was just kind of a, 
a sissified teacher. I don't know how else to put it, but, but that, that's not the image I have of him now. When you, when you really think about uh, who he was and being apprenticed to a carpenter at the age of 13 and working for, for 17 years as a carpenter, and, and that's the term we use, but the word that, we, that is translated carpenter that we, we think of as carpenter applies either to woodworking or stonemasonry. So he could have, could have been a stonemason or, or a carpenter. I mean, how many trees are there in that area? I mean, you know, it's, I think it might have been just as likely he was a stonemason as a carpenter. But either way, working with your hands. You know, there was no Tim Taylor with the power tools, you know, back then. It was all by hand, sawing by hand, it was, or chiseling by hand. No power tools at all. He had to have had biceps like nobody's business. He had to have had a six-pack. You don't think, we almost think it's sacrilegious to think of Jesus as being ripped. (laughs) But I think he was. I think he was a strong guy. He could have tore up anybody without God's help. But Jesus was meek, very meek. Now, that's a fascinating thought because Jesus is God, is he not? Jesus is God Almighty. Jesus Christ spoke the worlds into existence by the power of his voice. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Let the waters be separated one from another. Let the dry land appear. Let the animals come forth. Let us make man in our image. He made the entire universe. He is king of the universe. He is the meekest being in the universe. How can that be possible? Does it sound like a paradox to you? Meekness is the opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. <coughs> it, is, it is knowing that you can do something, but you're going to withhold. Uh, is there anybody familiar with Andre the Giant? Remember who Andre the Giant was? Big, tall dude, seven-foot guy. Uh, Princess Bride, you know, have to have to think of the Princess Bride. Remember how gentle he was? Um, that's how he was in real life too, by the way. I know he had this image of Andre the Giant as a wrestler and stuff like that, and he was supposed to beat people up, but you know that's all fake, right? <laughs> it's all orchestrated. Andre the Giant was a very meek guy. Why? Because he knew that, you know, he could take his fist, which is, you know, huge, and just cream anybody. You could kill somebody with, a, with this one punch. But it was restrained strength. He knew he was strong, but he controlled it. And that's why Jesus, the, 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 the author of all that we are, the creator of all that we see, the master of all he surveys, said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, he said. For I am meek and lowly in heart. He's not saying I'm weak and depressed. That's not what that phrase means. What he's saying is I know I can do anything. Is there anything too hard for me, God said. But I am meek and lowly in heart. Learn of me, he says, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. He's not talking about physical rest. He's talking about rest in here. Are you weary in here? Are you getting tired of everything that you're seeing in life around you? I mean, before this all all started a few months ago, the pandemics and the protests and the politics, all the stuff that's going on. Weren't you tired before of all the stuff you go through in daily life? Doesn't it get you down in here? He says, you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is God. Jesus, when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, we talked about this on Thursday in Union Hearts. When he was arrested in Gethsemane, he went there intentionally because he knew Judas knew the place. He went there to meet Judas and the arresters. And then Peter, the guy who was big and tough and strong, he was a strong fisherman, used to fishing all night on the Sea of Galilee. This is a brave guy. Make no mistake. Peter was was nobody's fool. Peter would stand up to anybody. 
Peter had a sword on him to defend himself, and he took it out and used it to defend Jesus. When the, the, all the people came with staves and staffs and tor torches and swords to arrest Jesus, he whipped out his sword and started whacking away at the Romans and the, and the palace guards. The guard ducked. Peter caught his ear and sliced it right off. He was going to keep on hacking away. But Jesus said, hey, put up the sword. Put up the sword. Don't you realize that I can call 12 legions of angels and the Father would send them to protect me, to defend me, and to avenge me? A legion is 6,000 at a minimum. 6,000 men, 8,000 horses. 6,000 at a minimum. 12 legions, if my math is correct, is 72,000 angels, right? 72,000 angels. In 2 Kings chapter 19, we have a story where one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians single-handedly. Jesus said, I can call 72,000 angels who are that strong, that destructive to defend me. He says, just put up your sword. Let's just go along with the program because there's a plan here. It's my plan. Let me handle it. You know, you can, be, you can afford to be meek when you've got that kind of power behind you, right? That's what meekness is. Do you know anyone with little man syndrome? You know what that is? You know what, do you know what a Napoleon complex is? When, when you get somebody who's real short and small, like me, <laughs> and, and, and acting like they're big and tough, they're going to take everybody on, willing to fight anybody. You ever seen that? Why do you suppose they're that way? Because they've got something to prove. Because they're really not strong. They just want to make you think that they are. That's why Andre the Giant doesn't have to be that way. How about dogs? You ever been around a St. Bernard? Big dogs, right? I've known a couple of people who had St. Bernard's. A fully grown St. Bernard, I, this is, this is serious, serious. I could put a saddle on it and ride it around all day. They're huge and gentle, very gentle dogs. You don't hear them barking a lot. They don't need to bark to threaten you. And they could take you out in a heartbeat, you know? But, but on the other hand, let me mention one word. Actually, it's three words. Chihuahua. You ever been around a chihuahua? Okay. How do they act? Well, they see you coming anywhere in their space. They're going to jump around. They're going to be barking their heads off. <clears throat> They're going to be threatening you at, at, the, at the top of their lungs. If you really get them aggravated, they're going to stand up and jump up as high as they possibly can, and with all their strength, they're going to bite you in the ankle. You know, you have more to fear from a little dog than a big dog. The bigger dogs are gentle because they know what they can do. They don't need to prove it. That's what we're talking about when we talk about meekness. Jesus was strong enough to be gentle. When you have superior and strength, superior power and strength, you don't have to prove it. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 4 through 6, this is how we are supposed to be. Paul writes, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Listen now. The servant of the Lord, that's all of us. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men or people, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's a, that's a powerful phrase. I'm not going to cut into it right now. But if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Folks, you and I are surrounded by people in our current culture who are fulfilling this verse, who are opposing themselves. You and I are watching the self-destruction of our society. I believe we are watching a revolution take place. And it's not a political revolution. It's a spiritual revolution. We are seeing numerous people involved in violence to try to get their way. 
to try to uh, accomplish their agenda. And many Christians are getting caught up in this. It's causing division among believers. This is exactly what Satan wants to do, is divide us over various things. The, the same thing is happening with the pandemic. Should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Should we socially, social, socially distance ourselves or should we go ahead and have our funerals and our birthdays and our parties and go to sporting events and go to schools and go to churches? There's a lot of disagreement and argument. There are people who are angry that we are here. What should we do about it? Well, we should not strive. We should not exacerbate the division that already exists. We need to be gentle unto all people, apt to teach. It is teach them. Well, why are we doing this? What should, how should we handle it? What should our response be? What does the Scripture say? How should Christians respond? That's teaching. We should be patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Whoa, what a mouthful. That's what's going on. I'm not opposed to anybody. People are opposing themselves. They don't realize it. But folks, we can afford to be meek with others, not because we are bigger and stronger, but because we have a Father who will fight our battles for us. If he can call 12 legions of angels to defend himself, he can certainly call it for us. <clears throat> All Israel needed was one. I'm reminded of, of a kid. Uh, we can be like a kid, you know. Uh, when you get into a, an argument with, a, with another kid, uh, and, and, he, and he says, well, man, if you, if you mess with me, I'm going to go tell my dad! That's what we need to do, right? <laughs> Only not so loud, right? So you mess with me, you're messing with my dad. And that's why the scripture says in Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. We're seeing a lot of anger and wrath in the, in the world today. How should we respond to it? Does, does some of the things that happen that you, that you see in the news and on TV, does it make you angry? You know, it makes me livid. It makes me very upset. It makes me want to go downtown and throw a brick through a window. But is that the right thing to do? Is that the right thing to do? Let me go on. Dearly beloved, avenge not your souls, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It is a good verse. You know, years ago, <clears throat> I, um, I heard somebody counsel a woman who was having trouble with her husband. And I've, I've kind of kept this in mind ever since because I thought it was good advice. Uh, you know, in, in marital relations, you know, husband and wife sometimes will go at each other or parents and kids will go at each other or kids and kids and siblings will go at each other. <clears throat> but I heard a, a pastor tell a wife one time, said, uh, um, you can try to retaliate against your husband and get back at him and, uh, for stuff he's doing to you and withhold stuff from him so he, he, you know, to try and get back at him. Uh, but you need to let God handle it. You need to get out of the way and let God smack your husband. Because right now, you are in the way. God can't do anything with him as long as you are in the way doing things yourself. And I can guarantee you that God will do a better job of smacking him than you will. Is that true? That's very true. Now, now, when it comes to injustice in the world around us, who can do a better job of righting those wrongs? You with your brick or your sign or God with all, his, all the resources at his disposal? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Don't make any mistake about it, folks. God can handle what's going on in the world around us, and he will. And it's going to happen soon. 
Justice will roll down, as Martin Luther King uh, quoted from the scriptures, it'll roll down like a mighty river, and it will happen. It will be a huge flood. When I think of that, I, 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 when I think of that passage, I think back to a few years ago when we went to Niagara Falls. And if you've been there and you've been to what they call the Cave of the Winds, when you take the elevator, you go down to the river level, and you walk along a boardwalk, and you climb up a series of steps. They rebuild this every year, because every year the, the force of the water tears it down. But you go to the top of the, 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 this uh, wooden deck. It's called the hurricane deck, the very top of it. And it's under the, the American side of the falls. And you, you can have some of the water actually fall down on top of you. Now, there's no way you could handle it if you were directly in the falls, but you're kind of on the edge of it, but enough of it comes down, it actually hurts when it lands on you. It's quite a force. It can actually push, push you down. Uh, if you stand right up against the, the left side of the rail and, and that, that water comes down, and even then, you're almost halfway up the falls. It's not the, com the complete length of the falls. And I think of this passage, that justice is going to roll down like a mighty river. The Niagara River is a mighty river. And that's a mighty falls there. There's a lot of power in that water. And I think of all the power that God has that he's going to bring to bear on those who are, in, are unjust in our world. And folks, I'm looking forward to the time very, very soon when God's going to handle it all. He's going to take care of this. So remember this passage when you're tempted to support those who are violent. It's a slippery slope. This is not the way of the Christian. This is the work of the devil. Point number two, all that was number one. Point number two, they shall inherit the earth. That's the second half of the verse. You already have it filled out because you knew where that was going. They shall inherit the earth. This is a promise for those who are meek. Zephaniah chapter two, verse three, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be that you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. See, the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Every day, if you are meek, he will hide you in the day of his anger. You don't want to be on the other side of the equation and have that anger yourself and get caught up in the Lord's judgment. You don't want to be there. I don't want to be in that path. But he says, seek ye the Lord, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. You know, that's how you seek the Lord. In order to get saved, in order to have his forgiveness, in order to have eternal life, in order to have a home in heaven, in order to have all those things, you must be meek. You have to be willing to realize who you are in God's sight, that you are a sinner in need of a savior and rest in his will. God says, if you, if you live out your life uh, without Jesus, you'll go into eternity without Jesus, and you will be forevermore without Jesus. You will live in a Christless eternity, and you don't want to be there. Because the alternative to heaven, and all of its glory, and all of its light, and all of its warmth, and all of its fellowship, is hell, with all of its darkness, and all of its heat, and all of its loneliness. There are only two options. Only two. There's no in-between. No second chance. Your opportunity is now to seek the Lord, to be meek and realize that the consequences of going into eternity without Christ is what I just described. Psalm 37 verses 1 through 11, fret not thyself because of evil doers. This is a great passage. You should underline this. In fact, you should turn, turn your Bible and underline some of this, even right now if you have an opportunity. Psalm 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Are you fretting now because of evildoers? Honestly, does all this stuff get you down? I know a lot of Christians who are down in their spirit because of all the stuff that's been going on this last six months, because of the, the virus, and we can't do this, we can't do that. We can't go visit our loved ones in nursing homes or hospitals. We can't have funerals. Uh, we, uh, we, well, at first, you were limited to 10. You couldn't have all your friends and family come to a funeral if your loved one died. Many saw their loved ones go into a hospital sick, couldn't go in to visit them. Their loved one died in the hospital alone. It's a horrible time for a lot of people. No birthdays. Graduations were called off. Going through all that work in school, and you couldn't walk across the platform to get your diploma and celebrate that with your friends and family. That's a down time. It's an awful thing to go through. And then these protests all around the country. 
And on top of that, we're in a presidential election year with all the bickering and complaining and accusations that are going back and forth in that. It's enough to drive anybody nuts. It's enough to make anybody sick, mask or not. It's getting people down. <clears throat> this scripture says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. And as I said in the opening uh, statement and after Brother Otis' song, we wanted to be in this generation. We wanted this to happen. We were told, Matthew 24 and other places as well, the times are going to wax worse and worse and worse and worse. Well, are they waxing worse and worse and worse? Well, what'd you expect? We're told that, right? We wanted to be here because we want to be the rapture generation. Now, folks, hold on to your seat. Just reach down on the right hand, on the left-hand side. Hold on. Just hold on. Just grab real tight. Hold on. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. The Lord will come back, but before he does, it will get worse and worse and worse. It always gets darkest before the dawn, doesn't it? Let me go on. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither is the green herb. Now here's where you underline, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Next one, delight thyself also in the Lord. Underline that. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This has, I think, a double meaning. You delight yourself in the Lord. That is a meekness. That is trusting in what, that what God does is always going to be for our good and his glory. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. That means two things. He means he'll give you what you want from in here, the prayers of the heart. Not the, not the, <coughs> uh, the outward prayers like, Lord, I'd love to have a gold wing, uh, a, a red gold wing Honda motorcycle with... with, with you know, with the hard saddlebags and the nice fairing on the front and the windshield and, and cruise control and radio and, and all this stuff. No, he's not going to answer that. That's a need. I mean, that's a want. Well, I guess, see, I've got myself confused. I think it's a need. It's, it's a want, not a need. But the desires of the heart, sometimes, oftentimes, I think most of the time, it's an unspoken prayer from the heart. You deeply, deeply desire this. God will give that to you. But conversely, the second part of that that I think is true is God will put the desires in your heart. I did not want to go in the ministry. It was a lot. I told my grandmother, I, she, she said, you should go in the ministry. It's a great profession. You'd be good in that. I said, no, oh, this is seventh grade. I said, no way. I don't think I said that out loud to her. <clears throat> but there was no way I wanted to go in the ministry. That was the last thing I wanted to do. Absolutely the last thing. But look, look what happened. God put that desire in my heart. I didn't put that there. Nobody else put that there. But God put that desire in my heart. There's a lot of desires that God puts there, and then he fulfills them, and he gives you what you want. It's really cool how it works. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Then it goes on to say, commit thy way unto the Lord. Underline that. Commit thy way unto the Lord. You know, serving the Lord means commitment. This is something that most people, I'm convinced, do not understand and don't do today. You commit yourself unto the Lord. Now, I'm going to get a little off track here, but there was a time when a lot of people would graduate from high school or maybe college, but a lot of people didn't go to college back then. They'd go graduate from high school. They'd go to work for a company. They'd work for that company the rest of their life. They wouldn't switch jobs every two or three years like a lot of people do today. There was a commitment to the company. And the company would commit themselves to that person. The company would offer a pension plan. You work here for so many years, we'll, we'll take care of you the rest of your life. But companies are not doing that anymore. Employees are not staying anymore. One's blaming the other. One's saying, well, I'm not going to stay at that company. They're not loyal to their employees. The companies are saying, I'm not going to be loyal to their employees. They're not loyal to us. But God has a great pension plan. You commit yourself to him. Commit yourself to him. Just decide at some point in your life. Now, I didn't do this. In the, when I first got saved, I didn't understand this concept. I, I asked the Lord to forgive me my sins, and I trusted him to save my soul, and I got saved. But it was quite a while after that 
It was a year or two after that before I realized what it meant to commit yourself to the Lord. And I gave my life to the Lord. Not just a year, not just two years, the rest of my life. Now, the Lord has reminded me of that a number of times over the course of my life. Because there were times, there have been times, there have been moments when I wanted to go back on that commitment. But the Lord says, remember that commitment you made? Remember that? I said, yes, Lord, I am yours. I am bought with a price. I no longer belong to myself. I don't have the right to decide what I'm going to do, or where I'm going to live, where I'm going to work. I don't have any right to decide any of those because I am a willing bond slave for Jesus Christ. That was a commitment I made. I'd lo- I-, I live to see others make that commitment as well. You don't understand what you're missing by not making that commitment, giving your life to the Lord. He gives you an eternity in response. That's a pretty good investment. You know, serving the Lord is great. The benefits are out of this world. That's not just a joke. It's absolutely true. But none of you are smiling anyway, except George. George is smiling. (laughs) For those of you at home, George is wearing a mask with a big smile on it, so... All right, he says, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. The next one, rest in the Lord. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to to pass. Now here's the command, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. That's where we get this passage in Matthew. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. You know, I I hang on these promises. When bad things happen in my life, people do bad things, people say bad things to me as they do to you, I just kind of, I, I try to let it slide. I try not to respond. I try not to react. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I do. But the Lord will remind me, it's okay. I'll handle it eventually. Give me time. I'll do it in my way. And you will be pleased at how I take care of it. And I always say, am. And so far I have. There's still some that I'm waiting for, but it'll happen. For, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. In other words, folks, if we stick it out, if we trust God to be in control, We will live in a world ruled by Jesus Christ with peace, with justice, with tolerance, with security, with plenty, and all in the presence of the Prince of Peace himself. All of it. And that won't be too long. I don't think it's much more than seven years off. Not a whole lot longer than seven years off. If we are living, as I said, in the last generation, we we should expect the things that we're seeing around us. But we should tolerate them outwardly. We should pray about them inwardly. We should take the opportunity that is, that is still ours, and it is, it's a window of opportunity that is rapidly closing, a window of opportunity to reach those around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think, now we should always be planting and watering, but I think this is especially a time of harvest because there's not a whole lot of time to plant the seed and watch it grow to, to fruition. It's more of a time of harvest. Because as I, said, as I said, the opportunities are rapidly closing to win our loved ones and our friends and our coworkers to Christ. Folks, we're going to be out of here before too awful long. And I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm asking, oh, Lord Jesus, rescue the, us out of all this stuff. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. The Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That why, that's why God is allowing this to go on, because he's giving every person an opportunity to respond to the gospel. But you and I are the instruments that bring them in. It's time to draw the net. There's not much time left. Who is it in your life that you don't want to see get left behind? How much time and effort have you gone into winning that person to Christ? If you haven't done much lately, now's a good time to start because you don't have much opportunity left. But let's do it with meekness. Let's go through the rest of this year 
not in anger at what we're seeing and hearing on Facebook and in conversations around the water cooler or, or in the uh, barber shop or wherever we happen to be when people are talking about these, these controversial things. Our response should be, as a Christian should, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. They think they're opposing each other, but they're actually opposing themselves. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to whatever the Lord's speaking to you about, and I have no idea what that is. I never do. That's the Lord's job, not mine. But if the Lord is speaking to you, respond to Him, would you? Father, thank you so much for all that you have done and are doing in our lives and what you have been doing in this service. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit who's speaking to hearts even right now, here in this room and those online. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to respond to what you have for us to say and do and go. And help us, Father, to reflect you in all of our relationships, whether they're electronic relationships, whether they're personal relationships. Father, I pray that you'd help us to reflect you. May others see you in us and not us. Father, if there's anybody in this room that does not know you, or anybody online that does not know you as Savior and Lord, may they trust you today. May they humble themselves, realize that they're sinners in need of a Savior, and their only hope is the shed blood and broken body of Jesus Christ on their behalf to pay for their sin, to die for them, to go to the grave for them, to be buried for them, to rise up the third day for them. Father, that's the only hope we have, the only hope we have. May each of us take advantage of that today. For we ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake, and with thanksgiving, amen. You come as we sing, as the Lord leads you.
Please be seated. I have just one announcement. That is tonight at 6 o'clock, we will uh, have 2020. Uh, we had a picnic last week, so we didn't have it, uh, but we will have it tonight. And the question, the leading question is, well, we probably may have more than one, is uh, what does the scripture mean uh, in the book of Ephesians when it says, let not the sun go down on your wrath? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What does that mean? So we're going to talk about that tonight in the service. And before... Um, before I forget, I want to thank all those of you who helped make the community yard sale yesterday possible. We had a, a num good number of vendors, probably about the usual number of vendors, had a little bit less uh, uh, buyers, but that was expected. But w I think it was better than what I was expecting in light of all that's going on. I think po folks were excited about uh, getting out and doing some normal things again. So it was a great day. It wasn't real hot, but I thank you all for being here and putting up with the heat we did have and a long, hard work day, but it was, it was great. I want to thank you for making that happen. Brother Don Krebs, I'm going to ask if you'd come and close us in prayer, please. Oh, also, I wanted to point out Maggie Stalling is here. Uh, say hi to her and, and stop by and say hello to her. So. Morning, also, before I pray, I want to thank you for all your prayers for my surgery, and things are going well, way ahead of schedule. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Prayer Amen. works. Amen. Speaking of that, let's pray. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this Lord's Day you've given us and for all that we're able to be out today. And Lord, even for those that are home and still dealing with issues. And Father, we just uh, thank you for the message that Paul brought to us today. Uh, Lord, we just ask the Holy Spirit to take that message and run with it in our hearts and apply it to our hearts and help us to get through some of these things that we face today in our life. Father, we ask you to protect each and every person as we go our uh, specific ways today. Uh, protect us on the roads and bring us back at the next appointed time. And we'll give you the honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Since the Savior found me, pardoned all my sin, I have had the joy of living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. They're underneath the precious blood of Christ at last. Save, 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 I'm happy on the way. Save, 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 I love him more each day.